Tinkering Tuesday, and we're going to repost the URL for everyone to see on YouTube. Uh, so we're right with you. And uh, welcome. Today's Tinkering Tuesday. I am Camp Director Nick Raymond. Uh, we're here today with uh, Gaber Tully from the Tinkering School. Also, uh, Hi, folks. how's it going, Gaber? Uh, where are you today? In your backyard? Well, I'm, uh, I'm in my backyard uh, down here in Montera, California. Awesome. And we've also got tuning in today the junior counselors, uh, Eagle Scout Dan Spangler, <laughs> and, uh, engineering intern, and then the ex uh, Girl Scout uh, Jillian. <laughs> How you guys doing today? How's it going, Nick? Good, good. Hi, Gaver. Hi, Jillian. Hi, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, Gaver, where would people uh, know you from? You've, you're the founder of the Tinkering School, which uh, coincidentally is uh, Tinkering Tuesday, so we'll go into that. Um, yeah. You're also the author of. Uh, 50 Dangerous Things That You Should Let Your Kids Do, <laughs> uh, we have in the Maker Shed. Uh, but you're also an author and a contributor to Make Magazine. So um, just right. Right, what's it like being an uh, author for Make? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> um, it, it's, been, uh, it, it's been really great. It's pretty much uh, every time I have a good idea, they say yes. And when it's a bad idea, they say no. So, <laughs> so it's the best possible relationship with a group of editors like Dale and Mark. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us more about the, the tinkering school and kind of how that fits in with today? Like, to you, what, what is tinkering? What is, what is that about? You know, I get asked this question a lot, what is tinkering? And I think we all have different definitions of what it is, you know, um, ranging from sort of generic fooling around with stuff to, to sort of getting something to work. And over the years, I've kind of more narrowly defined it as that stage between when something is done and when it actually works the way you want it to. That's the tinkering part. Over here is like all the building and the actual like the actual implementation, the construction of the thing. Over here is the part where it's like it should be working but it's not and you right. have to tinker with it. Yeah. So so that's tinkering school. We do a lot of building and then we save a lot of time for tinkering with it to get it working right. And that is actually like a hands-on summer camp, the, the tinkering school? That's right. It's a six-day, uh, seven-day sleepover kind of experience for kids where we've built everything from uh, roller coasters with 120 feet of track to um, various kinds of uh, sailboats, paddle boats. Um, we've built every kind of vehicle there is, uh, from motorcycles to go-karts to... Uh, just uh, this past week, we built uh, rail boats, and uh, a rail boat is a wind-powered uh, train, essentially. <laughs> There's an abandoned piece of railroad track uh, not too far from here, and uh, we built these vehicles that sail on railroad tracks, and it was a really fun design problem, yeah. Yeah, very cool. And then um, you are also the founder and co-director of RightWorks, uh, a K through 12 school in the city, San Francisco, California. That's right. yeah. um, does that kind of tie in with the same philosophy? It, it definitely does. You know, Tinkering School is a one-week kind of immersive experience, and RightWorks sort of asks the question: Why isn't school the most interesting place you can be? Right. And uh, and, and sort of tries to um, tries to. Uh, create an environment kind of like Tinkering School, but designed as a year-long program as an alternative to going to traditional school. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So I think um, we are going to post links to um, so all that we talked about. I'm just going to get those up about the Tinkering School and uh, Brightworks. And we're also going to post uh, the tutorial for the lashing at the top of the comments. Oh, great. Um, and then we'll also post, um, I believe there's four different Flickr uh, albums that we're going to be sharing with the, uh, the campers throughout today. So, um, as always, if you have questions throughout the Hangout, feel free to type in uh, the word QUESTION in all caps. Leave us your question uh, under the comments of this post. Um, if you have an answer for us, go ahead, all caps, answer. Um, let us know what you're thinking, and we'll have the meet team picking those comments and questions. Uh, Nick, I have a question already. Oh, yeah. Are Dan and I too old to go to Brightworks? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're you're not too old to come down and uh, and spend time with us at Brightworks. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Good question, Jillian. Um, 
Yeah, so we'll have those, and then throughout the Hangout, we'll also be directing you towards those um, those photo albums that are comment that are pasted on the top of the comments. Great. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, Gabriel, let's let's get into it. What are we uh, What are we doing today? Okay, so um, for the past I don't know six or seven years, I've been kind of playing with this technique that I originally read about in Make Magazine in an article by um, George Dyson. He, he wrote this wonderful article kind of about lost technologies and, and, and how over the course of civilization we've kind of invented and then lost things and then reinvented and things like that. And this technique of like tying things together with string or twine or sinew has, has basically been around off and on through the history of civilization and we've relied on it more or less at various stages in our development. And uh, what struck me about his article was this idea that we, we might have these really good ideas, but if enough people die out, like we lose a generation of those makers of that type, you kind of actually lose that knowledge and then you slowly rebuild it again as somebody kind of finds an artifact or something that says, hey, that was a good idea. And so <clears throat> I decided one summer that I was just once and for all going to learn how to tie two sticks together. Like that was my, <laughs> like my be all end all moment was like, I, I don't want to be bad at this anymore. I want to be able to <laughs> tie two sticks together like I mean it, you know. Yeah. yeah. And um, that's often the impetus for a lot of things I end up doing. But I, it just struck me as such a beautiful thing because all you really need is a couple of simple items. And hang on one second. The first, obviously, being um, some some twine or string. And you've got some. You've got some. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. It's it's really cheap. Like a uh, let's see, 2,500 feet, and I think it cost me eight or nine dollars uh, yeah. at Ace Hardware. 2,500 feet of anything for eight or nine dollars is just worth having at your house, I think. Um, but uh, when you get it, just remember the the string starts at the inside of the ball. Uh, uh, um, I've seen pictures of people who started from the outside and eventually end up with a giant hairball. I never knew that. <laughs> yeah. That's so. actually, yeah, in my garage how it is right now. is a giant spool of, like, tangled twine. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew you went from the center out, yeah. Yeah, so pull from the center and it'll behave all the, the whole time. The other thing you need is uh, what we call a spindle. It's just a stick to wind your twine onto before you start lashing. And the problem with using the whole ball is that it's a little bit big and clunky, and uh, often you need to sort of move your spool of twine around your stick a lot while you're lashing, and it's just inconvenient. So um, get yourself a little stick. Uh, you know, if your hands are smaller, use a shorter stick. If your hands are bigger, use a bigger stick. And when you're loading it with twine, don't load it all the way out to the ends because it'll just fall off and you'll have another hairball. So, like <laughs> another way to make a really fun hairball. So when you're loading twine on, use the center half. You know, leave yourself a little margin on each side. And uh, you start with a trick that we're going to use throughout the lashing techniques today, which is just compression friction from line laying over line. So instead of worrying about tying the string on or something silly like that, we're just going to start winding it onto the center of the stick here. And as you wind it, um, hold on here, I'm just going to tip my camera down a little bit so you can see my, <laughs> see my hands. Does that look okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as you wind it, hold it a little, hold a little tension into it. If you let go of the string and it's all loose, you know, that's just the beginning of another hairball. So. I think Nick's got one going. <laughs> okay. And then, um, just to do a close-up here, uh, you can see the loose end of my string is just getting covered by the successive windings. And that's what's just going to hold that so it stays out of the way during the rest of the project, right? And like a lot of steps in lashing, this is one where you just take a deep breath. You're going to be here for a few minutes winding. Uh, you want to load quite a bit of string onto this. You're going to actually 
kind of fatten your stick up until it's <coughs> sorry, getting over a cold. Um, fatten your stick up until it's about the diameter of your wrist, probably. So I'm going to pull a trick I learned from the famous CIA operative Julia Child, <laughs> which I just think is a great story that she was this famous chef, but she also carried documents for the CIA. It's incredible. Anyway. Um, Gabriel, does it matter if you move the stick and keep the twine steady or keep the stick steady and move the twine? Ah, that's a really good question, Jillian. Uh, sometimes we like to go like this, winding twine onto things. The problem with that is it either adds or unwinds the twist in ah. this string as you're doing it. So roll the stick. Roll the stick to do it. Good to know. And you'll keep the you'll keep the twist in the line. Okay. So, um, so rather than uh, do this in real time, um, <laughs> but I just wanted to show you, I'm kind of headed out towards one end. I'm getting about to the right section, and now I'm going to go back towards the other end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm keeping my, yeah, that looks great, Nick. Yep. I think you're a little faster than I am, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of these things where a couple of simple um, techniques sort of make all the difference. And these are things that I've learned from doing it and from talking to, um, my father was a fisherman, and he had some friends who were sort of old school fishermen. You know, everything was all uh, rope work and, and um, yeah handmade wooden fishing boats and things like that. And there's a trick where you you hold the string in your in in three of your fingers. Yeah. And then as you're going on to the line, you're you're kind of pinching the string as it goes on. Oh, okay. And you end up laying down a very tight coil like without that much now, of that is a yeah, good technique. I yeah. like that. Yeah, that's good. Nice. That looks perfect. <laughs> okay. So um, well, we're, gonna, we're doing okay here. I'm going to keep going with this. Uh, anyway, you know, that's one of those areas where we're sort of on the, on the cusp of losing a generation of rope work knowledge is this old school sailing. And you have to go, you have to go to other countries now to really find populations of people who have this kind of lore just as part of their culture. Right? You can still find people here in the U.S., old sailors, um, old merchant marines and things like that, who have a lot of this knowledge, but they've become kind of an uh, endangered species, I'm sad to say. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a school of knot tying in San Francisco at the Maritime Hall downstairs, like in this dark dungeon basement, and they, they have this very rigorous curriculum about getting a not certification. I think it's sort of like Boy Scouts on, you know, it's the MIT version of the Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, as you're doing this, sometimes you'll find uh, where during the manufacturing process, the rope is broken and they've tied it back together. Uh, it, it, this rope is so weak, it's, um, it's just six pound strength. You know, you can actually, if you really get into it, you can break it. What does the six <laughs> pounds refer to? Six pounds is the, uh, how much weight you can hang on the rope before it will break. Oh. Okay. You're, there's supposed to be a length of it that you're using as well. Like, you know, over this much span. I, I forget what the national standard is for that. I think it's like a, I think it's like 10 feet or something like that. Hmm. That's kind of how they, they, uh, the metric they use? Right. So most ropes are listed by, by two qualities. Their, their, uh, their strength. So if I say it's a, this is what's called six pound test line. That means it was tested at six pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and it has something like a 1% stretch. It's the, it's the, it, it barely stretches at all, whereas like climbing rope often has a 15, 
percent stretch and it, it's designed to absorb impact in case you fall off a mountain right yep so it's like right. a giant shock absorber Jillian are you a climber is that why you said on belay <laughs> yeah we were showing off our knot tying skills before we started and the, those are the only knots I know how to tie is climbing yeah. knots <laughs> well I once made a case that the climbing knot the figure of eight single or double is the only knot you absolutely must learn to live a full and complete life. Oh. I'm good then. <laughs> what about tying your shoes? <laughs> you can wear Velcro. Uh, okay. Yeah, or slippers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you know if you know how to tie the figure of eight, uh, uh, in fact, I think this might be my next article for Make is like 50 things you can do with a figure of eight knot. That would be great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I better learn soon then. <laughs> I'll teach you, Nick. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jillian. Yeah. Um, so, so Giver, uh, I'm about to have enough here, so I'm just, I, I, I'm just um, chatting a little bit so we can get started. Is Go there ahead, a difference Nick. between uh, between rope and twine? Um, oh yeah. I know we were mentioning, and then like, yeah. Yeah. Or sinew. So, or, so sinew is from animals. Okay. Right? Sinew is like tendons in your arm and things like yeah. that. Yeah. <coughs> and what's nice about oh, sinew is it uh, shrinks. You can like treat it and it'll shrink it'll like become a permanent bond. Yeah. Mm. And that's why the Inuit people when they were making their stitching together their kayaks use sinew because it, it gets wet and then it dries and then it gets wet but it doesn't expand as much the second right. time and it starts to like harden into this. Yeah. And you can... Uh, you make the, I guess the the idea was as I understand it was you make you stitch your kayak together right let it dry out and then you rub it with like seal blubber oil yeah ah. to waterproof it and to get the sinew to absorb the oil instead of the water right so that's not oh. right Dan? Yeah. Yeah. that seems like a like a scout piece of scout lore yeah have you done that Dan uh, <laughs> we did work with sinew though that's so cool <laughs> we did arrows. what about seal blubber <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, all right, this looks good enough to do a lashing. Um, just going to put a few last on here, uh, and you know, if you ran out in the middle of a lashing, you would just temporarily tie off, wind up your spindle again, and then tie your string into where you were before, and then continue. So what knot do you use? Uh, <laughs> well, with this stuff, oddly enough. Um, I use a I use what's called a surgeon's knot. It's a okay. it's a modified square knot. Right. I wouldn't use it in any other situation, but since this stuff is so sticky in relation to itself, it seems to work really well and it's easy to teach. Why don't you just use a regular square knot? That's what I was always taught. Yeah. I I don't have a good argument for that, Dan. Let's try okay. both today <laughs> and see what works. Okay. Um so it's all about tinkering, right? That's yeah. right. There you go. <laughs> it's really, I think tinkering supports a very experimental work mode. You have to be re willing to kind of put in the time to test an idea and then kind of look at it and evaluate it. So, so far, spindle, uh, twine, and then, uh, you know, everybody should have a knife of some sort. Lately, I've become kind of a fan of the generic utility knife purely for its availability and and ease of keeping it sharp by replacing a blade. Ah, excellent. Yes, multi-tools. Um, and uh, to keep from catching the line on something, which once my dog was running by and she caught the end of the line on her stick and she ran up the yard after a deer. <laughs> I knew exactly where she was because yeah. I could <laughs> follow the trail. So... Uh, just a quick knife, and I'll, I'll leave this on my little counter here to keep track of it. All right, so we're sort of ready to start lashing, and uh, that's good. Our slow, uh, slow-moving cooking show here. I'm going to just tip you down just a little bit here, folks. So hang on. Okay. I think that's good. Can you, you see the top of that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. I brought an assortment of sticks, and uh, someone asked me earlier today, where do you find sticks? Um, I uh, use a lot of eucalyptus sticks because eucalyptus is a, a hostile invader in California and um, not protected by anybody. And every eucalyptus tree you remove is a good thing. 
<laughs> so it is. Uh, tinkering school harvests from a couple of groves nearby that I've found that have um, very little poison oak in them, which <laughs> is another thing that cohabits well with. And Gabriel, uh, I've heard that um, eucalyptus is dangerous because of the shallow roots. Is that right? I uh, yeah. Out the coast. I know that they they're prone to knock over. Um, they are. Yeah. They also lose branches very easily too. Oh, okay. And firefighters call them. Um, they have a name for them. It's like they're super flammable, right? Yeah. They call them the wood bomb or something like that. Because <laughs> a dried eucalyptus tree will just explode when it catches fire. Right, so, that's like the oils in the bark, I think, or the... Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, let's see. It looks like you can see what's on my lap here. Um, I'm just going to pick another stick. I'll pick one of a different diameter so that we work with two sticks, different sizes. Um, the other place that I've found sticks, like when I'm visiting people in other cities and we need sticks for a lashing project, we... Um, we call uh, tree services, you know, people who cut down trees for a living. Oh, what a good idea. Yeah, they're often, they just feed the branches into the giant chipper shredder. And yeah. if you call them and say, hey, where are your jobs today? They'll, they'll tell you because they would rather not have those chips. Yeah. <laughs> they have okay. too many chips. Okay. Um, so to start with, let's just look at our crossing sticks together a little bit you know, forming the corner maybe of, a, of the beginning of a structure. Maybe I'm going to put another pole over there, and uh, we're going to um, see if I sit down here. Oh, yeah. There you go. That works better. Yeah. Uh, if I was going to put another pole over there, you know, this would be the beginning of it, right? And the nice thing about working with lashing is you can kind of start your work anywhere and then, um, and then move it around. The lashing has just a little bit of give in it, so you, you don't have to worry about if I had screwed this in with two screws, I'd have to be careful to support this end while I was working mm. so that I didn't break that bond. Um, uh, with lashing, I can kind of let it bend around a little bit. So here we go with that. And let's see. I'm just going to move this around until you have a good view. How's that look? That looks pretty good. I can break you if you want. Dan's winding a spindle over here. Oh, That's good. Good too. Yep. So, uh, I think I'll put the big stick in the front so we can see the detail a little better. Um, just like when we were winding the spindle, I'm just going to leave myself <laughs> a little bit of a tail to tie off with. So, maybe three or four inches here. I have a question about that. Uh, oh, yeah. Again, I was uh, always taught to use like a clove hitch for starting your lashings. Yeah. Um, um, I don't buy it. You don't what buy it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I guess, um, I guess I'm insufficiently informed on the pros and cons of that. <laughs> so, okay. Dan, what is, a, what is a clove hitch? What is, I know uh, it's a simple knot. You just wrap it around a stick twice, and then you stick it through the cross. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I I think that could work. Um, I don't think it adds any value per se. So so here we okay. go. And here's the tricky part about lashing is unless your sticks are floating in space in a perfect relationship to each other, the start of it is a little bit awkward because you're holding the sticks and your string and you're about to change hands. And so this is Maybe another that would thing. Be the benefit of the knot is you don't have to hold it and you have that gives you a free hand to. Yeah. Well, let's try, your lash. try Dan's uh, approach here. Around the stick twice and then through the cross. Just make like a cross the two loops and then you just go through the middle of the cross. Cross the two loops. Oh, oh, a clove hitch. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, Gaver, is this, are we, are we making something specific or this is more like just the basics of lashing? This is just the basic techniques of lashing, right? Okay, now. so you can apply these same techniques to, to many different kind of structures. Yep. Okay. Exactly. All right. So per Dan's recommendation, we've we've clove hitched the start of our lashing. <coughs> and then uh, we're going to um, start going around. So 
Can everybody see that okay? I can kind of, it's about as close as I can get to my camera. Yeah, we can see your hands and the... Uh, okay, good. It's fine. So I've, I've tied this onto the front. You can also just pinch it and hold it, especially if you have an extra hand, if someone's helping you out. Now, we're going to create a, a very simple repetitive pattern here that's essentially custom. We're making a custom piece of rope out of lots and lots of strands of twine. <laughs> so um, we're going to start uh, coming back uh, around what I call um, doing the under. So we're, we're going, if this was laying down, it would be under this stick. And we go over the first stick. So it makes a perfect little U um, yep. around the two sticks. And I'm going to pick this up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, that's good, yeah. OK. Um, it's a perfect little U. And what you want to do is keep following this pattern. I'm now going to go under again, around behind. And then back over the top, right along where my string started, where my, thanks to Dan, my clove hitch is. I'm going right over my clove hitch. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you, want, you want these to be, you kind of would like everything to be kind of perpendicular to each other, if that makes sense. The, the lashings on the string in the, I mean, on the stick in the back are spaced of, <laughs> My stick is a little bit long. Uh, are spaced about as far apart as the as the diameter of the stick that was in the front, right? Oh, okay. So, so oh, okay. there's a kind of there's a kind of logical construction to this, where the relationships of the sizes of the various things determine the spacing. You don't want. I'm going to come around over here and show you. You wouldn't want to lash this way over here because those lashings would just slip over eventually and be loose. So you're trying to find the shortest path for your lashing to take yeah. naturally. That makes sense. Yeah. So the first couple of lashings, I'm not worried about keeping it tight. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to build up the basic structure as I go. And uh, I'm going to use a stick over here to prop up my, the other end of my work. There we go. Okay, so here's our stick, here's our lashing, and uh, everybody can see that pretty well, I think. Looks okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, the main thing we want to do is don't lose your tail. It can be very easy to sort of bury the tail of your lashing um, somewhere inside all these lines. and. You're going to want that at the end because it makes the tie-off so much easier. Okay. So we're going around with just another layer. And again, I'm not worrying too much about tension yet. I'm just kind of keeping it tight enough to work with so everything isn't slipping around. At what point does the tension become important? Well, I was just about to say I've got three, it looks like I've got three strands following the path over and over. And that's about when there's enough there now that I can pull on it and nothing slips. So now I'm going to start pulling on it. And uh, hold on. Now, every time I come around behind, I'm giving it a good strong pull. And as I pass it over the front, I'm just where my hands are sort of at their least advantage. I'm just keeping that tension on it. So, good strong pull. All right, so this is the basic pattern. And you can look at them as kind of two interlocking U shapes mm -hmm. on the lashing. They sort of fit together at 90 degrees. Uh, you can think of it as um, over, under, over, under, which the kids use sometimes when they're lashing as a way to remember. And what you want to do is don't, don't lose track of where you are. Don't um, just hold the tail up here out of the way for a second. If you come across and you go over to the wrong side, you'll see all of a sudden you have this like lone line running at an angle. You don't want that. 
that's uh, you'll end up sort of uh, coming at your tie-off line at the end at the wrong angle. So it it, uh, it all fits together into a system. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is lay down about 10 or 15 of these lines. Gaver, I have a question. Yeah. Is there a reason that you limit it to the two sides on each of the sticks and not just go around every different which way? Does it make it stronger that way? Well, the problem with every which way is sort of like an invented knot. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you just, like scramble some rope together and you go, look, I made a knot, you have no idea how strong that is. You just don't know where its strength comes from, so if it can be trusted, will it hold up when it starts, when you put a load on it, will it hold up if you jerk on it, you know. Um, the same applies here in lashing. If you just go every which way, you're not really sure how that is holding together, like why it's strong. You might It might feel strong, but you can't actually kind of defend its strength. You can't say, oh, it's strong because of this, or it's strong because of that. Um, if you do it this sort of sensible, regular, structured way, um, you can look at it, sort of, uh, you can uh, observe the, the, the configuration of the lines, and you can see where the weight I in the structure is being carried by those lines. And I'm just about to talk about that. Oh, great. <laughs> oh. Um, so, in a lashing, uh, unlike screwing two things together, um, the beauty of screws is that they're very fast, you know, um, or a nail. That's another great way to stick two pieces of wood, especially together. Um, the problem with them is they they don't have a very graceful, what's called graceful degradation. They don't stop working in a way that's predictable and uh, graceful in that it stops working gently instead of catastrophically. Um, if you, if we were to screw, if we were to put a screw in this pole right here, um, mm -hmm. obviously it would, it would have the same, it would let the stick move up and down. It would pivot around that screw. Um, but uh, we, we would be able to um, move that stick all the way around and eventually kind of unscrew it. But also, if we put weight on it, it would work right up until the moment that it completely broke, right? So as we stood more kids on this, on this bar, say, we would get <laughs> one, two, three, crash. Right? <laughs> if it was a screw. So I don't want to come here right? <laughs> anymore, neighbor. Yeah. Um, and if, you, if somebody sort of puts up those flicker links, you can just go ahead and put all three of them up. Um, okay, they're, they're all up there, uh, Gaver. Okay, so should we look great. at a special one? I think they're ordered one, two, three, four, like you gave Whoops. me. Um, uh, you know, now that I've given them to you, I can't quite remember what order they're in. Okay. Maybe it's the cold medicine. Um, uh, the one I'm sort of curious about is um, one that has a whole bunch of kids standing on a structure, all in orange shirts. Do you see that one? Anybody see that? Let's look under the I'll chat. Keep going around. Okay. Okay, while you're looking for those, because I just wanted to show, like, how strong the things we've made are, but basically we put, uh, we put over 1,000 pounds on a lashed structure recently. 1,000 mm -hmm. um, pounds of children, which is always an interesting <laughs> way for parents to think about things. Um, yeah, so Gaver, if you if everyone goes to the the first uh, Flickr pool link that we posted, um, it's the very last picture. You'll see what is it like, eight or nine kids in in orange yeah. shirts. Yeah. Standing on that. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Yeah. Plus me and two other adults, I think. Yeah, so that'll be the first oh, link that we posted uh, for the Flickr pool. <laughs> Can you guys hear my dog barking? She yeah. Just yeah. Out here. Okay. Um, so we've got. Uh, 
I lost a little bit of count, so I did a few extra. We've got at least 14 layers here um, of, of twine. And we have a lashing that's, that's fairly strong. But what we need now is something to really bind them together. And this speaks to Jillian's question of where does the strength come from? What we're relying on is the compression of these lashings against these string, against these sticks. And that lashing is going to kind of grab onto that wood. That's the reason this twine is so useful, is it's really sticky. It's a, it's a lot of friction. And to increase that compression, to really squeeze those lines against the twine, we're going to do what's called the crossing lashes now. And the crossing lashes go around between the, um, between the two sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's my tail that I had started with. And I know I haven't done an accidental move because I'm back here meeting my tail at the way that I want to do my tie off. So I'm going to set myself up for success by keeping that tail out. And now, instead of going back around like I had before, I'm going, <coughs> I mean, sorry, back under, I'm going around in the crossing lashes, which means I'm kind of sneaking between the two sticks. And on this one, as it comes around, I'm just going to do one here, and then there's a wonderful sound. It's a little bit like old, I think it's kind of steampunk era kind of sound, or maybe even pre-steampunk, which is the sound of rigging, you know, stretching, lines stretching and rubbing against each other. I'm going to tighten these crossing lashes and put the microphone right up against them. See if this works. You ready? <laughs> okay. That's a really powerful noise. That's actually the multiplication like, of my few pounds of pressure, less than six pounds of pressure, obviously, because six pounds would break it, amplified, multiplied by each of those wrappings, each of them taking that three or four pounds I'm putting into it and adding it to the compression against the other stick. So I'm going to go around a few times this way each time looking for that little bit of creaking noise. And this is definitely one where if your string breaks when you're doing this, you want to back up and redo your crossing lashes because this is really the secret of lashing right here. The, the secret strength of lashing is actually the crossing lashes. Now, Gaber, it's a little bit hard to see, but if I oh. understand correctly, instead of the interlocking use of the first step, this is just a circle, right? Yep. Right here. I'm just Got going... So you see ah. it goes all the way around. Yeah. As opposed to the, the U. Just going around and around. You can see right there. Mm -hmm. can, we see, uh, can we see yours, Dan? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and so, Gaber, is there a difference between, um, like, just dead weight and squaring weight of 1,000 pounds of kids moving around? <laughs> there the, is. The lashing change? Um, no, it's the exact same lashing technique. Okay. Um, you know, a live load, like a whole bunch of kids, is a different thing because there's a lot of changing dynamic, sort of what they call the vectors of stress are, are changing all the time as the kids play around. Um, you lash a bunch of sticks together and it attracts children like monkeys. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um, it's amazing. It attracts adults too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to finish off our crossing, now we have our tail and we have our crossing kind of coming at 90 degrees to our tail. So to, to meet our tail at the right angle, we just go down and around the original stick or the stick where the tail is, sorry. <laughs> and I usually do this a couple of times here because I want to retain all that tension that I put in the... Um, uh, that I put in the crossing lashes, I don't want whatever knot I make here to, to be responsible to hold all of that tension. So I do a couple of wrappings just to add some friction so that the uh, knot doesn't have to do all the work. All right, so here we are, and uh, we've met our, we're going to cut off our spindle. Um, just leave myself a little bit of room. Cut the spindle off, and now uh, 
Dan assures me that a, a, a square knot is completely sufficient here. I have been doing the slightly more complicated um, surgeon knot. knot, but the square knot is just basically start like you're tying your shoes. Pull that tight, and then over. go over and under again and, and uh, lay that on down. You go over. And oh, okay. you have a little knot. Yep. A little knot. And this is... That's pretty strong. Yeah. Ta-da. It's strong enough. It's strong enough for this. You wouldn't want to, like, trust your life to a knot like that. <laughs> Gabriel, I have a question from one of our viewers for you. Oh, please. Brooklyn wants to know, what is the best type of rope, and what is the worst type of rope? <laughs> okay. Um, the best type of rope, there's two, there's two things you want to consider. Um, are you building something that's going to be outdoors and in a lot of weather? In which case, uh, you want to use a rope that is um, resistant to ultraviolet uh, decay from the sun. So those cheap, um, a lot of the cheap nylon rope you can buy at Home Depot and Orchard Supply and things like that, those break down over time. So don't use those okay. in, in, in the outdoor situation. Mm -hmm. um, the natural fiber ropes tend to hold up really well, but they can be susceptible to rot in rainy places. Oh. But we've built things with lashing here in Montero, which is one of the foggy places in California. And um, they've lasted for years. You know, I, I've checked the lashings over time. They haven't come loose. These, um, this is made, this twine is made from Cecil, which is also used for a lot of braided ropes. Um, it's just a natural fiber. On the other hand, it, it's unreliable. I mean, it, you know, don't trust it for anything, but um, it's, it's really fibrous, and if you're working with it all day long, uh, like on a big lashing project, I helped somebody make a um, garden trellis once with lashing, and you want to wear gloves. It, it, it kind of chews up your hands over the course of the day. <laughs> um, so here we have a lashing, and now to just sort of demonstrate what those crossing lashes did, I have unsupported the far end, and I just want to tip this so you can see both ends. And now I'm going to let go with my hand, and you can see that these are as good as screwed together right now. It's pretty good. Yeah. And um, I think uh, if you'll allow me, let me see what you can see here. Back to the corner of this little thing. What I'm going to do, I have to take off my headset and run away for a second uh, okay. to, uh, to demonstrate something just right over there. It's okay. just that doesn't reach. So hang on. But what I'm going to do is turn this upside down and stand on this supported by my one single lashing. And uh, wish me luck. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> So there he goes. All right. All right. And now he's going to jump on it? More than stand, I'm going to jump. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fully supporting his weight. That's crazy. That's impressive. Ta-da. Ta-da. Yay. <laughs> so these are really strong, resilient connections. Yeah. They handle a lot of abuse. And... Um, they really don't mind if you wiggle them around a little bit. They, they can get loose, and if they do, you can just stick more crossing lashes right on top of what you had before, or unravel your old crossing lashes and redo them. So um, sometimes I do that, like when kids are lashing, they have trouble keeping the tension all the way through the process, and um, the result can be a little bit loose at the end, and then sometimes an adult can just come in and help them with the crossing lashes, and then they they have created something that's actually perfectly strong and suitable. Um, so that's the basic um, that's the basic lashing, and uh, the um, the question that I often get asked next is, well, what if you have three sticks to tie together? Yeah. You know, how do you do it with three? Um, there are special techniques for three, mm -hmm. but there are also simple techniques for three 
that just do the same thing again, just lash your third stick to one of your other two sticks and treat it as a separate connection. The three will act as a unit together, but you don't actually have to like involve all three sticks in the lashing at once. You can break it down into lash two sticks together, then add the third stick and lash it to one of the other members. You don't even have to, you don't have to join them sort of the connection of all three sticks doesn't have to be between all three sticks. Okay. So we try to keep those situations simple. <laughs> um, and in those Flickr photos that we put up, you can see some examples of that uh, where we built structures. And, um, you know, as soon as you're building something that someone's going to sleep in, you, you want something flat. And so a tripod structure isn't that useful. And you end up with these kind of um, rectangles and lots of crossbars and things like that. And, and a lot of places where things jam together in threes and fours. And we just break them down into sets of two, and the kids can handle any combination of two really well. So, um, so Gabriel, right. there's a couple uh, pictures. If you look, uh, we posted it to, I think it's the Flickr pool number two. Um, oh, okay. And they're building a couple of these cross sections that have, I'll even try, you kind of have like a cross section, and then you have multiple supports Oh, know, yeah. More than like three, you're like four kind of <laughs> really messy looking. But um, yeah. is it the same idea? You kind of work in pairs of two? Yeah. Um, okay. We've done, there are situations sometimes, especially when you're building things out of lashing, you, you, you can kind of start and then add strength as you need it. Okay. I was looking at how they do scaffolding in India and Singapore, which they, which they do a lot of, uh, actually all over Asia. Um, they, they lash bamboo together to create scaffolding on the outside of buildings. Yeah. You know, whereas in the United States, we have, um, we have like, scaffolding units. Right. Like a yeah. Lego set. Yeah, they're you know, scaffolding it. Out of yeah. It just all fits together. Yeah. And uh, instead, what they do is sort of build as they need it. And so there are these very organic accretions on the outside of big skyscrapers and things as they, as they build. And often what they do is, they build up and it sort of shifts a little bit and they add some more things to it and then they build up higher. And the same can be true with lashing. You can kind of sketch your structure and then find its weaknesses and go, oh, if we just added one more member here going at this angle, it would stop it from slipping down the hill or whatever. It's like the tinkering <laughs> process continues. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You just tinker with it until you feel like you were, it's safe enough to sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> or walk under, or whatever it is. Um, uh, so what other kind of structures uh, could we make? I saw in the Flickr pools there's some ladders. Um, there's some kind of like yeah. tripod looking things you can actually stand if, if on. We just, um, uh, we just held this like this. You could imagine there was another member right here, and that would be a rung on a ladder. Right. So that's a really good way to build a ladder. Um, one of the kids invented, and I think it's in that pool, a single pole ladder with crossbars and mm. then ropes down the outside to keep the um, rungs from tipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. It was actually, you know, laziness is, a, is the mother of real invention, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tie both sides. So, um, yeah, that's in, uh, that's in the second Flickr pool. I think it's like the third or fourth image uh, in that photo album. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant innovation. It wasn't, it wasn't the most stable ladder ever, but it definitely worked. <laughs> And um, you can also build, um, what's really nice is that you can build sort of an interface between um, manufactured lumber and natural lumber. And um, so when we're building and we're using living trees and things like that, we're out, at, at tinkering school we're always trying, except for the eucalyptus, to never harm the tree. And uh, we... Um, we often use lashing as a way to connect, to make a base on a tree that we can build off of okay. using screws and nails and things like that. So, That's so cool. Yeah. Gaver, we've got a, another question from a camper who's watching. Oh, yeah. Valentina wants to know what type of materials could replace twine if you don't have it available and you need to build something oh, yeah. strong enough to be a raft? Strong enough to be a raft. Oh. Wow. Well, um, 
we wondered that too, and uh, we built we built a rope bridge uh, 20, 30 feet long out of recycled plastic grocery bags, the little throwaway plastic film. We braided those together to create twine, and then we braided twine to create rope, and then we used rope to make a rope bridge. Wow. Um, that's all that, cool. Yeah. That also oh, held. <laughs> I'd imagine it has a lot of stretch. <laughs> it did. Yeah, that was like 50% stretch. Or something. <laughs> it was really, yeah, it was a little bit like working with, um, I don't know, rubber bands. And yeah. to figure out how, but once you pulled all the stretch out of it, it started yeah. to harden up. But, okay. Um, so um, other things that you can use for lashing if you can't find twine, I think really any... Um, Anything that you can imagine as a twine-like substance, I'm not like you know we we've even done it, we've done it with dental floss, we've done it with um, we've done it with wire, um, a lot of concrete work. The rebar structures that they make before they pour the concrete are lashed together with uh, nice. what's called baling wire, and they use two techniques. One looks almost identical to this. They just don't do the crossing lashes usually. And then the other one is just a simple around in a circle, and they have a special tool for cranking up the tension, mm -hmm. um, which you can do with wire, not so easily with rope. Um, that's a good question. I, I've, never, I've never really been in a situation where I couldn't find, get my hands on twine. <laughs> <laughs> um, although where, where could you find more twine, uh, Daver? Is it more like the hardware yeah. store is the place to find it? That's where, like, we get it in the garden supply section of hardware okay. stores is the most easy place to find this kind of twine. Um, the, there, there are lots of places you can order it, like Amazon and places on the Internet. I don't think you carry it in the maker shed. <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little, yeah, it's a little primitive, I think, for the maker yeah. shed. Um, there's also, um, oh, Whoops, hang on. <laughs> Just ask me if I was still here. Oh. <laughs> I, I guess I hadn't touched my mouse in a long time. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, there's a lot of um, different kinds of twine, different kinds of rope. Jillian, you asked, or the person on the phone, at, or I mean on the line asked, um, what are some bad kinds of rope to use? <laughs> Um, actually, like really slippery, like paracord can be difficult to work with because it's so slippery. On the other hand, if you manage it correctly, you can make an incredibly, I, I think you can make architectural level connections out of paracord. I think you could, you could actually build a house with paracord. <laughs> um, it's pretty environmentally stable in terms of its UV resistance because it has that extra coat on the outside that's purely... Um, sacrificial. It ha it has the um, the strength in the core, and uh, it's a pretty um, durable, or we found it to be pretty durable. Um, if you're working with fatter rope, uh, you're usually doing that if you're doing larger logs. Like when we're working with logs that are sort of this big around and up, that are actually heavy, we'll work with uh, quarter inch natural fiber rope. We'll do the exact same thing. Um, it's just nice there because you can do the tie-off slightly different because you have this big cord, and you just actually tuck it back through the gap between the sticks. Oh, okay. And, and tie a keeper knot on the other side, just a little square knot to hold it there. Oh, cool. But ask yeah. Giver, I found um, in the makerspace here we're using oh, yeah. like bungee cords. Are, are bungee cords a good idea or <laughs> not so much? <laughs> They've got a lot of stretch. A lot of stretch, right? <laughs> and you can't, there are very few knots you can reliably tie in a bungee cord that will okay. eventually roll out. Yeah. Um, one more question from another camper. Yeah. Nick wants to know, are there any knot mnemonics, uh, uh -huh. a story or a saying to remember how to tie a specific knot? Oh, yeah. Um, there are. Uh, I bet I bet Dan knows some of these from Eagle Scouts. Well, I, I used to know one from bow lines. It was about a rabbit going around the tree and through the hole. And yeah. I can't remember it. Um, Dan, if you wouldn't mind holding up your rope, I can talk you through the uh, 
There's a rabbit in the hole for the figure oh, of eight. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. All, All right. of my rope is down at tinkering school this summer. So, um, right. so the the working end or the rabbit is in right. Dan's hand, and yeah. somewhere in front of his chest is about where we're going to call the tree. Okay. <laughs> so the the rabbit <laughs> the rabbit runs over the tree. Runs over the tree. Yep. Yeah. Uh, runs up and behind. So. Behind. Yep. Yeah. And down through the hole. Down through the hole. And there, you have the figure of eight knot. Awesome. All right. <laughs> the only knot you need to know, right? That's right. It's my hypothesis that if you just knew that knot, you would survive life on a desert island. <laughs> yeah. uh, Peter, Peter wants to know, what's the tallest structure you've ever made entirely of rope and twine and wood? Oh, wow. Um, well, once down in Austin... We did a weekend. Uh, we did a one-day project with a bunch of little kids, and we built. Uh, these were pretty little, five to, I guess, five to eleven-year-olds, and um, we built a structure that was about twenty-five feet tall. And then um, <laughs> here on my property, uh, as a kind of exactly that sort of challenge, we built up actually about thirty-five feet before we got nervous, <laughs> and then we actually <laughs> took that top part off. Um, but I think that uh, structures have been built using lashing that are much taller than that. Obviously, scaffolding on skyscrapers and things like that, hundreds of feet tall. And I don't know if you all remember this uh, tribe in uh, South America that ties vines to their feet as a sort of coming of age thing and they go up on this tower and they yeah. jump off. It's sort of the original bungee jumping. Yeah. Right? And, and you're supposed to be like, your hands are supposed to touch the ground. And, um, and they and you're responsible these, for how long your rope is. So right. you miscalculate your dead or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or if you don't touch the ground, you're, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, um, or you picked bad vines or whatever. <laughs> I mean, uh, but, Just uh, don't throw that at home, right, Gamer? Yeah, exactly. Don't throw that at home. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I think that it scales really well, and I think that um, it's one of the reasons that engineers are kind of looking at it, again, as a, fascinating, as a fastening technique, is that it has a lot of resilience and forgiveness for error. And, uh, hmm. again, it, it degrades gracefully. It tends to... And we can try this right now just as a part of the wrap-up. I'm now going to use all of the leverage of the sticks to break this, uh, this lashing, just as the thrilling conclusion of this. And uh, to do it, I'm going to have to brace this. I'm going to tip this down so it doesn't go off screen. All right. And what we should hear, I'll stand right close to it because it's not going to throw anything, is... Ah, uh, me groaning. <laughs> okay, I need a little more leverage. It's possible my stick is going to break first. Here we go. I'm going to put my full weight on it. Ah. Wow. And yes, it's the stick that's breaking and not the last <laughs> <laughs> uh, so The stick actually broke before. That's yeah, amazing. There we go. So, so the stick broke before the twine did. And uh, that's, the, that's the power of this additive and multiplicative strength that you get from adding six pounds of strength every time you go around and then tightening that with that crossing lash. You end up with something that's really, really strong. And uh, we've found this before. Probably if both sticks were as thick as the large stick, yeah. we could have broken the lashing, but it, it would have taken all my weight. So, right. Dan and Jillian, do you have any more uh, questions for Gaber before we wrap it up? No. All right. All right. Well, uh, Gaber, thank you so much for uh, being here on Tinker Tuesday. Again, a, uh, a reminder, we're going to have the junior counselor hangout uh, about half an hour afterwards. If you want to be a part of the, the invite for that, leave us a comment uh, below. Let us know, hey, I want to be in the hangout. And uh, today, for about half an hour, uh, Gaber's going to be joining us. So if you want to have questions for Gaber about knot tying or any lashing you saw, uh, be sure to join us. Again, leave us a comment. Uh, special thanks to uh, Jillian and Dan uh, for 
being here with us today. And uh, Gaver, before we go, is there, a, is there a way that people can get a hold of you? I know we posted some links um, yeah. to the Tinkering School, but do you have like a, a Google Plus uh, account or? A... Uh, I'm uh, I'm on Google Plus um, just as Gaver Tully, and uh, you can find me there. Um, okay. I'm also I'm just Gaver on Twitter, so uh, that's a great way to keep track of what I'm up to. Um, I do try to publish regularly about the projects that are happening at Tinkering School and things like that. And uh, the Tinkering School blog through the whole summer uh, updates um, daily during the Tinkering School sessions, which are every other week. And uh, we try to put enough in there that people could do the projects themselves just by reading through the blog and seeing the various steps. So, Okay. Well, awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in about a half an hour for the uh, Junior Council Hangout. So, again, Gaber, thanks so much. Thanks, Gaber. Right. We'll see you next, yeah. Dan, Jillian. Bye. Nice to meet you. Yep.